for them. He really wanted to help them. And I think that when we look at this and we see what he did, we see what Paul wrote to the church at Rome. And I've mentioned this passage several times. Everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. But when we look at the example of Nehemiah, we find one who endured. And by his endurance, we can see how we can be encouraged. And we can also get some hope in our own lives for today when we see what happened with him. Nehemiah, as I mentioned, he heard about what was happening there in Jerusalem, the danger that people were facing. He mourned and he prayed. And then he began to formulate a plan to do something about the devastation. And so he waited for four months. That's how long it took for the right opportunity to arise for him to be able to say something to the king of Persia. For some days, I mourned and fasted and prayed for the God of heaven. After hearing the message of the situation of his people in Jerusalem, He's upset. He begins to pray. However, he couldn't rush into the king's throne room and demand three years leave. Three years leave of absence or I quit. Well, he didn't have that kind of authority to quit. Nor could he make those kind of demands to the king of Persia. Instead, the first thing that he does is pray and wait. And I think we see in that Praying and waiting, two signs or examples of qualities of leadership in him. O oh Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this your servant, to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. I was cupbearer to the king. Of course, the days turned into months before the day of success arrived. And God can answer his request in more than one way. There's no limit to God's power. And how do many people try to change other people? Well, they use deception, manipulation, intimidation, all those kind of things. But that's not how God does it. We can be encouraged when we think of the example of John the Baptist today. John did not perform one miracle. And he changed the lives of so many people because of teaching God's love and his wisdom to people. And I think we can relate to that. Now, Nehemiah sees the opportunity to speak and there doesn't seem to be any, any, an extraordinary way that Nehemiah is able to influence the king, except being thoughtful and careful about what he said to the king, which is what God's wisdom teaches. And so you see how God is helping him through his wisdom. And here's what he said when the king gave him the opportunity Four months after hearing the news of what happened in Jerusalem, the bad news about Jerusalem and its safety, I took the wine and gave it to the king. I had not been sad in his presence before. So the king asked me, why does your face look so sad when you are not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. I was very much afraid, but I said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? The king said to me, what is it you want? Then I prayed to the God of heaven and I answered the king, is there anything wrong with the short prayer? I mean, that must have been a really brief prayer. And there's power in short prayers. We don't have to pray for a whole hour for it to be effective. A 
short prayer. And by the way, this is our Xerxes the first, a bas relief that is in modern day Iran there, of him. You can't see his face that well because it's kind of torn up a little bit. But that is him right there. That's who he stood before. And so he continues to say, I answered the king. Well, what did he say? If it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my ancestors are buried so that I can rebuild it. Then the king with the queen sitting beside him asked him, how long will your journey take? And when will you get back? It pleased the king to send me. So I said the time. I also said to him, if it pleases the king, may I have letters to the governors of Trans-Euphrates so that they will provide me safe conduct while I arrive in Judah? And may I have a letter to Asaph, keeper of the royal park, so he will give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel by the temple and for the city wall and for the residence I will occupy. And because, and because the hand of God was upon me, the king granted my request. The king sees his sadness and he asks him about it. And this was his opportunity to start wisely and he did. May the king live forever. I think that's a wise way to start, don't you? To go to Jerusalem and rebuild the walls because of the distress of his people. He's not blaming anyone. He just knows that they're distressed and he's concerned about it. This was his request to the king. God's wisdom can be persuasive when we use it. And that means that we need to read it, study it, meditate on it, memorize it. Wisdom is supreme. Therefore, get wisdom. Though it costs all you have, get understanding. Esteem her and she will exalt you. Embrace her and she will honor you. And Nehemiah was honored. Because he was using God's wisdom right there in his life. And so the wise, here are a couple of examples. The wise in heart are called discerning. And pleasant words promote instruction. A wise man's heart guides his mouth and makes his lips persuasive. Nehemiah used pleasant words of respect and how he felt. May the king live forever. That sounds pretty pleasant to me. I mean, I would like to hear that, wouldn't you? And then he says, and why should my face not look sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins? And so the walls were in ruins. And Nehemiah was going to face many challenges when he arrived at Jerusalem. He travels hundreds of miles to Jerusalem, fully prepared. Nehemiah's great challenge when he arrived was to motivate the people. And who does he have to work with? The discouraged. That's it. And he's not going to make any assumptions about the condition of the city. So he's going to give a full examination of it. He's going to get the facts. And he went by himself in a sense alone. But he wasn't going to keep it that way because he needed teamwork in order to succeed. So he was going to try to influence these people in that way. And so the motivation. Once Nehemiah arrived, arrived in Jerusalem, he was determined to examine the situation personally. His purpose was to rebuild the walls. But what was his motivation? His motivation was this. He needed to instill within others the motivation he had. And his motivation was not just to build the walls. But also according to his prayer. To influence the people to properly serve the Lord. O oh Lord. Let your ear be attended to the prayer of this your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. He wanted them all to delight in revering God's name, serving him. And this is harder to do when you 
are, are dealing with people who are discouraged and afraid of their enemies. But this was the result he wanted. For the people to delight in serving the Lord was his motivation for rebuilding the walls around Jerusalem. And the same work of rebuilding will be the serving of the Lord. I mean, in the process of building together, they are serving the Lord. And so it starts right then when they start building. Too many, too many people are like a ship without a sail. They have no direction, no compass to help God. They're just drifting along in life. They're like the title of, of a book. And by the way, I looked up the title of this book at Amazon. It's there. Okay? If you don't know where you're going, you'll probably end up someplace else. You can buy it at Amazon if you want to. We know we are to be on the right side, doing the right things, being righteous, revering God on the right side. But too many people are like the guy digging ditches. I like this example about the guy digging ditches and he's asked, why are you digging? He said, well, I need money. Well, why do you need money? Well, I need money so that I can buy some food. Well, why do you need food? Well, so I can gain strength. Why do you need strength so I can dig ditches? It's just a vicious circle, isn't it? There's no real purpose in that. But here he is. He's there. And the task of rebuilding the walls was not going to be a case in which a group of workers would be working together to build a little garden fence or a little brick wall. It was a wall for fortification. And it would be composed of massive blocks that would need to be moved and assembled. And it would involve skill in lifting and moving machinery. Not only was this a difficult task, but it was one that they had tried to do before and hadn't succeeded. So Nehemiah had to overcome a mindset. In modern terms, it's a mindset of defeat or discouragement. It could be worded in different ways. It might be that we've already tried that. And you can go back and look at Ezra chapter 4. The letter to the king from Israel's enemies said, The king should know that the Jews who came up to us from you have gone to Jerusalem and are rebuilding that rebellious and wicked city. They are restoring the walls and repairing the foundations. And it was put to a stop right then. So here he comes on the scene. And he's going to try to motivate them to start rebuilding again. We've already tried that. I mean, I can just imagine some people saying that, couldn't you? Or they might be saying, saying something like this, you know, there's not enough help. Hey, it's going to be a mighty task. And let's give it more thought. Not that again. Come on. Not that again. And so here he is. And all he's got to work with are the discouraged. Those are the only ones. And the only thing that may have changed now from when he originally heard the message several months before is that they're more discouraged now. That's who he has to work with. The discouraged. He was told by his brother Hannah and I that they were discouraged. And they said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been buried with fire. And when Nehemiah came, there was no big fanfare, no big show of his arrival. There was no big banner announcing his arrival. Our Jewish brother, Nehemiah, arrives, cup bearer to King Artaxerxes I, King of Persia. There was no announcements like that. When Sam Ballet now, there was a, uh, a group that really, when they found out about this, did not send a welcoming committee to him. When Sam Ballet the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official heard about this, they were much to serve that someone had come to promote the welfare of the Israelites. Well, 
Before he got there, this is what happened. So I went to the governors of Trans Euphrates and gave them the king's letters. The king had also sent army officers and cavalry with me. Well, the enemies heard about this. And so he arrives. I, I went to Jerusalem. And after three days, after staying there three days, what did he do for those three days? <coughs> Maybe he rested. Maybe he started to talk to people, find out what their emotional situation was, how they felt. We're not told. But one thing we are told is this. He began to examine the condition in Jerusalem firsthand. He saw with his own eyes what the situation was, the walls. There was going to be any assumptions on his part. He got the facts. That's what he did. He determined to see with his eyes the situation. So he says this. I sat out during the night with a few others. I had not told anyone what my God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. There were no mounts with me except the one I was riding on. He would see the situation firsthand, which would give him more information to develop the plans that he had, or further confirm the plans that he had. But he makes a thorough examination, not a superficial one. He describes it in detail. He says, by night I went out through the valley gate to the jackal well and the dung gate. I mean, people would have known this, the locations and what it meant to them. Examining the walls of Jerusalem, which have been broken down, and its gates, which have been destroyed by fire. Then I moved on toward the fountain gate and the king's pool. But there was not enough room for my mouth to get through. So I went up the valley by night, examining the wall. Finally, I turned back and re-entered through the valley gate. The officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing, because as yet I had said nothing. I had said nothing to the Jews or the priests, or nobles, or officials, or any others who would be doing the work. And this procedure is valid, isn't it? For all areas of our lives. To observe. To examine. To get the facts. To formulate a plan of action. Based upon all of those facts that you accumulate. And then work the plan. For example, we can find this principle in the following two Proverbs. The heart of the discerning acquires knowledge. The ears of the wise seek it out. Or this one, talking about observation, looking at the situation, getting the facts. Well, here comes a guy, he's walking across this field, and he comes to a certain field, and he sees, I went past the field of the sluggard. That's the vineyard of the man who likes judgment. Thorns had come up everywhere. The ground was covered with weeds. And the stone wall was in ruins. I applied my heart to what I observed and learned a lesson from what I saw. A little sleep, a little slumber. A little folding of the hands to rest. And poverty will come on you like a bandit. Scarcely like an armed man. That's all in Proverbs chapter 24. And a good, growing, spiritual perspective. Armed with God's wisdom. Our guidance gives us the foundation for building the walls of spiritual health against temptation and for inner strength for us. So again, a growing spiritual perspective armed with God's wisdom, which help and guidance helps with that perspective, gives us the foundation for building the walls of spiritual health against temptation and for inner strength. And so we've got to build those walls. When we get the facts, making a thorough examination of our lives, what do we discover? Here's a summary statement of how Jesus grew, which also gives us a way to examine our own lives. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men or people. Many people overlook the fact that taking care of our bodies 
is part of our spiritual health. Jesus grew in stature. That's the physical part. He grew in stature. Why get a physical examination? Or have a diagnostic test done if uh, something's wrong? Of course, to see what level where you are health-wise. To see if you need to make some adjustments, maybe in lifestyle, maybe take a certain kind of medication. You do all of that for that. And of course, if you're doing some things that are, are hurtful to you, you want to solve them. They're not contributing to your health. Do you not know, when Paul writes to the church at Corinth, he says, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? who is in you whom you have received from God? You're not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. Honor God with your body. So if we go to a doctor, he could prescribe walking more. It's only God's wisdom. I'll give you an example. I've given it to you before. Go to the ant. You slow your considerate ways and be wise. Now, in this little picture here, it seems to me like they're, they're walking and lifting weights, aren't they? Go to the ant. Consider his ways and be wise. I've shown you this little video before. Are we like ants? What is their lifestyle? Just think of the characteristics of an ant. Ants take the initiative, and they don't let obstacles get in their way. They're persistent. They're always on the move and are industrious. You don't see any couch potato ants. And of course, there are many benefits of moving, like control of blood pressure, blood sugar. Uh, it changes. It can change your mood, uh, alleviating you from the burden of stress. So Jesus grew physically, but he also grew in wisdom. In wisdom. And when you think of that, for Jesus grew in wisdom, in stature, and in favor with God and people. Well, that's kind of a mental area when you think about wisdom. Researchers surveyed what percentage of churchgoers actually read their, their Bibles daily. Now, I'm going to share with you this research that was done. If you don't want to believe it, don't. Don't believe it. But... Uh, it may sound a little bit legitimate to you also. The results aren't surprising. Now, let me tell you this. Researchers surveyed what percentage of churchgoers actually read their Bibles daily. And I'm saying that the results aren't, shouldn't be surprising. In this survey, 90%, 90% of churchgoers agree with the statement, I desire to please and honor Jesus in all I do. And 59%, I agree with the statement throughout the day. I find myself thinking about biblical truths. Now, you might not give a verse, a, you know, book and verse for it. But you could be thinking about these, these truths that come from God. But what's the next point? 90% of churchgoers agree with the first statement. 59% agree with the second statement. But only 19% read their Bibles daily. Now, you can choose to not believe that. But maybe you would agree that, you know, I need to read my Bible more. If you're going to give yourself a real personal examination of that, what would you come up with? What would be your conclusion? I need to read my Bible more. I need to actually study it. You know, certain passages, meditate on them, try to understand them. Maybe some even memorize, as I've mentioned before. Now, on Wednesday nights, we are, we are having different speakers give biblical lessons. And we start with a scripture reading, and then a prayer, and we sing. And our speaker this Wednesday night will be Glenn Williams. Now, I told Deanne, uh, Denise that I was going to remind you, Glenn. I, I didn't say I would be in the sermon, but, but anyway. And then the next week, it's going to be Eric Berry. The next week after that, Russ, it will be you. And the week after that, Steve, it's going to be your turn. So those are our speakers coming up in the next few weeks. 
So be sure you come and hear the lessons they present. Sing songs of praise with us. Psalm 1 says this. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and its leaves. And its leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. And then the final one here that Jesus did. He, Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and people. Well, that's social, isn't it? That has to do with social. And that relates to Nehemiah coming back to, to Jerusalem. Like I said, he came alone in a sense. And to do what motivated him to do. But he was not not going to do it by himself. He needed teamwork to do that. He needed the help of others. And so teamwork, teamwork was, was needed. An important factor for teamwork is found in the following paragraph from Nehemiah chapter 2 verse 17. And what we see in this are the certain the kind of language that he uses. We, us, and we are the words that he uses. He's identifying himself with them. And can you imagine him doing anything else? The language he is using is similar to what Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus where he says, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths. But only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs and it may benefit those who listen. And so I think this is what he's saying. He says, then I said to them, you see the, the trouble? He didn't say the trouble you are in. He said, you see the trouble we are in? Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been burned with fire. Come. And he didn't say you here. Come let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem. And we will no longer be in disgrace. He is really related to these people, isn't he? He's not setting himself apart. He's one of them. And so here's what Nehemiah says right there. The we, the us, the we. I also told them about the gracious hand of my God on me, what the king had said to me. And what did they reply? They replied, let us start rebuilding. So they began this good work. And so here he is, he's seeking a team, and they are responding in this way. Let us start rebuilding. They began this good work. When we work together, work can be accomplished. We motivate, we can motivate each other, encourage one another, and help other people. And we help with our endurance too, each other. It's easy to break a pencil, isn't it? One pencil. But try four or five. And it's much more difficult, kind of like what Solomon wrote, two are better than one because they have good return for their work. If one falls down, his friend can help him up, but pity the man who falls and has no one to help him up. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. And I just started to put pencils in there instead of the strands. Hard to break. And so in working together, you know what happened? He tells what happened. After they faced so much opposition and danger as they were building the wall, they had to start getting out their, their swords and everything else. They had to post guards they were under great threat. It wasn't just the, the massive job of building the wall, but it's the threat of the enemies that were there too. So, the wall was completed on the 25th of Elah in 52 days. When all our enemies heard about this, all the surrounding nations were afraid and lost their confidence because they realized that this work had been done with the help of our God. 
So remember this problem. Commit to the Lord whatever you do and your plans will succeed. That's what they were doing. God was at the forefront of all this. They were serving God as they were building the wall. And they were going to be revering Him and doing so in greater safety. We have the safety from the weather right here in this auditorium. And it would have been kind of nippy sitting outside this morning. But we have this. And it's easier for us to worship that way. Well, can you imagine with a wall built around them, how much easier it will be to, to worship God together? But they had to, and we see in all of this, there was prayer. Prayer, there was planning. There was hard work. There was all that travel that he took. He planned out in detail with all the governors as he went through their areas for provisions to be able to do the building. He gets there and he speaks with language of we, us, we. And then they respond with let us. And they're all working together. They all see the great need that is there. And so let's work together for the cause of Christ. This is how God wants us to do it. We are the body of Christ and Christ is the head of the body. We are the body of Christ now. We are. He's, he's not walking on this earth, but he's walking in a sense through us. And he's the head. So let's work together for the cause of Christ. If you're subject to the invitation of Jesus this morning, if you've never met him in the waters of baptism, where he meets you as your master, your savior, 